is this, to stand up on my own, to suffer this abuse, and to be so courageous about it. Um, and um, I watched as she was arrested in Cleveland um, in 1998, a very distressing day, to say the least. Um, and even there, how gracious, gracious she was, even in that circumstance, was quite astonishing to me. Um, and I, I know that, that, that all of this is somehow interconnected, I think. Um, but we've been on programs before where, and especially because it's Mother's Day, where you've talked about your mother. And, um, and I, th I thought about that a lot on the drive down because um, I, in the way that you describe your relationship with your mother, there's a certain element of that that, that I share with mine. Um, and I just wanted to tell you that since it is Mother's Day. Um, no. So that's a lot of other reductions. Thank you. Well, I'm not sure what to add to this in that um, I do want to um, say that um, um, that for me, I can understand why some people maybe don't get it at first because we've all grown up in this pop culture, you know, uh, permeated with all these images that come to us through the television and mass media and product label. I remember Saturday morning cartoons. Do you remember those where the red red Indian with the big belly and the cricket feather crosses in his eyes, whatever, slapping himself in the face? I remember those. Maybe you can still see them on Saturday morning? Maybe? <laughs> An F troop. Um, do you remember that? Kind of a stupid sitcom. And there was a character on that named Pink Cloud. Do you remember that one? Kind of the lusty, busty babe, you know, the short skirt, and her name was Pink Cloud. And I remember I was about 11, 12 watching that. And um, I remember uh, the name Pink Cloud and wishing I had a pretty name like that. <laughs> it tells you how powerful media is. Um, because I'm watching somebody who's supposed to be representing, you know, supposed to be a native person, and I didn't recognize myself really, but looking at it and, and wishing, gee, I wish I had a name like that. I remember asking my grandmother if I could have a name, and um, she did give me a name, and thankfully it wasn't Pink Cloud. <laughs> she gave me the name, and names are very important within our culture. Um, if you're lucky, you uh, are born with a name. Uh, some of us, you know, it's been a process of reclaiming our culture because it's been purposely stripped from us. Uh, the turn of the century was that time where they took the names that we called ourselves and then imposed, you know, the, you know, these other names on us. And our part of the country called them hat names. So when we are confined to the reservation, part of the process of stripping the culture and identity of the people is take their names that they call themselves in their own language and then impose names on them. So my tupia shishimta, uh, and in the hat, I should say, there was religious names, religious names and or president's names. So we picked a name out of that. So tupia shishimta became Ellen Moses at the turn of the century. And my uh, Tzila Stuasi became Joseph Moses. So their own names for themselves was taken away and then these names were imposed on them. My grandmother was given the reservation name Nancy Moses. It was Nancy who gave me my name, my spirit name basically, back to me when I asked for the name back, for a name. And she thought about how, what she could call me and she thought about it, and, it, and often what we do is, is uh, we'll get a name that belongs to somebody who has done something in our community, and it's a way of it living again. She gave me the name Slumta and, uh, when I was 12, and I remember being a little bit disappointed because it wasn't pink cloud or something <laughs> pretty like that. I want to make the connection between the, the powerfulness of mass media and you know that is in conflict with us making sure that our culture survives. Um, Slumta uh, was the name of a, a warrior woman within our community, and uh, my grandmother, thinking and thinking about what she could call me, um, 
gave me that name. And then I remember asking my my mother later on, what does that mean? And, and we all live in this kind of fast-paced society where sometimes we don't have time to explain things. And I remember my mother telling me, it's just a name, you know, it don't, don't ask me what it means, you know, it's just a name. But I remember being persistent in asking what does it mean, because I knew it had a meaning. And our names are not easily translated in our language, it's because, because it's, you know, it's like every syllable of it or every sound of it is representative of a, of, of a, a character. You know. um, and I asked uh, this elder circle what my name meant, and they talked and talked in the Spokane language for a long, long time. But 20 minutes had gone by after I asked them what my name meant, and I thought they forgot the question. <laughs> And they went on and on, and they finally, and they're going, no, no, we're still talking about it because we have to get it right. And we want you to make sure you understand what your name means. And it, it, you know, and if we tell the story a little bit, we have, we're trying to find a story that says what your name means, which is not about a thing, but it's about a, a character. Um, and they finally agreed to the story after talking for about 20 minutes. And they said, you know, in the winter time, when all the leaves have fallen, and you look up in the trees and you see one leaf that is hanging by a string. And the wind is blowing the heck out of it. And you're thinking to yourself, it really should fall, but it doesn't. That's what my name is describing as that characteristic of that leaf. It should fall, but it doesn't. So um, they wanted to make sure that I understood it, you know, and that it was, it was not descriptive of those things, but of that that moment that it really should fall but it doesn't. And in many ways, um, I'm so proud to have that name, and in many ways it makes sense to me now. Um, when I think about what happened at the University of Illinois, I'm a first generation going to school. Uh, my mother had an eighth grade education, and um, she was one of 12 children that were born in a tar paper shack on the Spokane Reservation. And only four of those children survived to be adults. Mm -hmm. And that was not unusual for that time period. Um, so for me going to school, you know, um, it was a dream come true. Not for just me and my family, but for my, my nation. And we all know, many of us who are here today who have gone on to get an education. We know what it takes for us to survive this very hostile environment called the public school system, <laughs> you know, which has pushed out more of our people than any other. Um, to go to the University of Illinois, I didn't go to, to cause trouble. You know, I went to get an education, and I really got an education at the University of Illinois. <laughs> Not what I thought I was going to do. And the three of us that were recruited, there was three, Norman Akers, uh, an Osage man, uh, Marcus Ammerman, a Choctaw man, and myself. And Marcus got pushed out first because he dared criticize the use of the Indian mascot after he got there. And when we went there, remember, this was a dream come true for us that turned into a nightmare almost overnight because we didn't think to ask what their mascot was. Who would think that you needed to ask that question? because our university should be places where all our identities and our culture is respected. Um, we saw uh, fraternities and sororities, because their athletic identity was this Indian mascot, they had buck and squaw dances, they had uh, home of the drinking alliance, which was a bar where they had a falling down drunk Indian over and over again. Um, this was just a little bit of what we saw. And Marcus criticized it first and he became the target of people people in the community who called him day and night, day and night, and told him if you don't like our mascot, we're honoring you, you can just get the hell out of town. So, you know, there's this, this same kind of language that I hear and every, everywhere I, 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 you know, challenge uh, the use of the mascot. Austining was very hostile, I have to say. Um, to a, pl a place where they say they honor Native people. You know, it was, it was 
truly a hostile, one of the most hostile I've seen in a while. Um, and they don't quite make the connection between this ownership of this image and the real people. Um, and Marcus was pushed out of the community after being there only a month. And that's the hostile environment I'm talking about. We were told, we were told, broke, well, one of the professors who recruited us broke the news to the two of us who were left, Norman and myself. And he said, you know, Marcus left last night. And he said, one little, two little, three little Indians who goes like that. And then he goes, two Indians left, thinking that that's funny. You know, but this is what we mean in terms of kind of pop culture um, and these educational institutions, you know, trivializing the pain and trivializing the struggles of the people. And that nursery rhyme was used to trivialize um, the genocide of the people. You know, one little, two little, three little Indians, you know, um, two Indians left, you know, one Indian left. Um, and it was devastating for us. And remember, I went there with my children, and once I realized that being in that environment was uh, hurtful to their self-identity and their self-esteem, then I realized that I could not be there and not address it. So for me, in, in many ways, it was an easy thing to do. I had really no choice. If I didn't say something or do something about what was going on in the community, then how do my children know that their identity is something important to protect? And, um, and I know what it took for my relatives to keep those things that are central to our identity alive so that they exist today. Because who we are is our story and our, our names for ourselves and our history and our song and our spiritual way of life. That is who we are. And the fact that we have those songs today and those spiritual uh, uh, those things that are central to a spiritual way of life, the reason we have it today is because of the strength of our ancestors. And so for me, um, it was an easy thing to do. And my mother continues to be there in the background. Um, and I know that even today, she continues at 70, I'm not sure how old she is now, she's 70-something, um, still gets up every day and goes to a job. She is a maid. She is among the brown hands that, that collect the trash across America. So on Mother's Day, you know, it's very clear that there's a connection between all of this stuff. And this is not how you honor people you respect. And my mother, my relatives, our people, they are honorable. If it's truly about honor in our educational system in this larger community, then there are better ways to honor a people. You honor a people by teaching real history. Teaching real history and coming to terms with what really happened here in America. To talk about the American Holocaust. To talk about the colonialism that's happened here and what that what price you pay. Um, that's how you honor people. And as an artist, I understand how powerful um, images are. And so I hope you'll come back and help me and come witness you know some of the work that I do here because I'm going to, as an artist, I feel like that's my strongest way to address these issues is. Um, to try to create environments where uh, these images are right next to each other. Um, and how, um, how it's hard to see the real people uh, around and behind the weight of the, these pop culture images.
really looked for the role of being um, anything other than a good mother, you know, a good family member. Um, I've never looked for it. It's like it's it's a role that, in terms of being one of the leaders of a movement, um, I never look for that. It's like something that came to me. Our people paid with their very lives to keep what little we have left. The fact that we even have anything today speaks to the strength of our ancestors. And that is what I'm protecting. If I knew ahead of time what was ahead of me, I would not have come here. And I certainly would not have brought my kids here. Look at the best man in the world! No. Are you ready, man? No. It's a fall Saturday afternoon at the University of Illinois. Great day for football! Fans come from all around to support the home team, the Fighting Illini. Go Illini! It's a mix of business and pleasure politics, and local celebrities. And everywhere is the symbol of the University of Illinois, a fictitious American Indian character called Chief Illini. Chief Illini has been part of the University of Illinois for 70 years. Dancing at halftime of home football and basketball games, the Chief has become a crowd favorite. He's a focal point. He draws the community, the student body, the faculty together. Little was heard from American Indians about their feelings on the Chief. But that all changed one night in 1989, when a Spokane Indian graduate student and a mother of two was asked by her children to take them to a basketball game. I got tickets to the game, and I tried to prepare them ahead of time of what they were going to see there. You know, it's, you know, they have this Indian mascot, as you know, they wear paint, some people wear feathers, you know, they have war chants, they have, um, you know, I just tried to go through all the things that they would experience there. So, you know, you just have to ignore that, you know, just enjoy the game. It was when the chief came out, and I'd never seen him, never seen him before. Didn't know at all what he looked like, what he wore. You know, I just heard that the chief comes out and does what's billed as an authentic dance. And he came out wearing that buckskin, really beautiful buckskin, wearing uh, what looked like real eagle feathers all the way to the ground. And of course, the fans go into a frenzy, and all around us there were these people standing in the seats, yelling, the chief, the chief, you know. Um, and it was, um, you know, my kids, you know, just sank in their seats. I thought my daughter would try to become invisible. My son tried to laugh. And with me, it's a sadness that still won't leave me. But that sadness turns to anger, just like that. And it still makes me really angry because I know they still do that. And I know that they're hurting other people when they do that. And I knew that I couldn't be here and not address that issue. My children know who they are. 
They're not confused about who they are. They know who they're Indian. They have been taught to respect the person who has earned the right to wear an eagle feather headdress. What I saw in my children was a blow to their self-esteem, and it still makes me angry. traditional American Indian community. She was raised near a reservation in Spokane, Washington, and grew up learning traditional Indian culture, ceremony, and religion. She too was trying to pass these traditions on to her children. At home, we're taught to respect eagle feathers, respect the chief, respect dance, respect um, you know, that um, paint is sacred, um, that dance is something that is sacred to us. If you don't come from a community, if you've never been taught, you know, to respect those things, it might not bother you, even if you are Indian, you know, it might not bother you. But if you come from a community and you grow up within a community, where those things have meaning, it's going to have that impact on you. They had that on me, and it definitely was just a blow to my kids. Because what they saw was things that they've been taught to respect being mimicked and reduced to, you know, this um, entertainment event and trivial life. And I knew that I probably was going to sacrifice my student status by speaking up. But I thought that it was worth it. So I started to stand outside alone, you know, because I didn't know what else to do. October of 1989, the current Chief Illini Wick was giving a talk at the Student Union, and Charlene decided to go. Today, Tom Livingston, the university's current chief, was scheduled to talk about the history and tradition behind the mascot. Livingston said his speech was scheduled before the controversy, and that he did not plan to defend or debate the issue. Chief Illini Wick is designed to be inspirational, majestic, reverent, moving, we got there a little bit late, and I made it through the crowd to where I could see him. And he was holding up the chief headdress. And when I saw him holding it up like that, you know, it, it really made me angry, because he was holding it up like a trophy. Charlene Teeters is a Native American who says the only thing authentic about the chief is the costume, and she called the dance mere gymnastics. You keep referring to your dance your, your eagle feathers, your outfit, your costume, whatever it is you want to call it, as ceremony, as religious. Why is the university involved with some kind of religious ceremony at halftime? I see the mascot as a symbolic display of our leadership that we control you, we own you. Every time that was being paraded around, I felt I had to also be there to challenge it. One university spokesman says there's little chance the U of I will get rid of the chief. Liz Merdian, Channel 15 News, at the U of I. Indian caricatures became a part of the University of Illinois landscape.
But these were different times in America. Blackface and black caricatures have virtually disappeared from the mainstream. Indian caricatures remain. These images should have gone by the wayside along with little black Sambo and the Frigo Bandito. If it was uh, any other religious practice that was being abused, we would hear about it. We'd certainly hear about it if it was some kind of uh, distortion of a Catholic ceremony or, you know, a Jewish ceremony. We would hear about it. But somehow, because it is a, a native practice and ceremony and religious items and practices, it's not respected. <laughs> 